we're about to watch two different CEOs describe the same robo-taxi future. Rivian is attempting to build the technology from scratch, while Uber is trying to build the network that connects it all. But the main takeaway here is that self-driving cars are no longer just a science experiment. They are becoming a very real business. We're building technology to enable very high levels of self-driving. That means the hardware platform, the data architecture, the data flywheel to train this, this uh, foundation model for driving. And this is something we're very convicted in. I've said many times, this is where we're spending a very significant part of our R&D dollars towards self-driving, towards autonomy. It's our biggest spend category. And we're very bullish on what we're building. And so what we're demonstrating today with, with the vehicles is showing just the, one of the first steps. It's a point-to-point -point full self-driving capability, um, but that's only gonna grow over time. You are making this primarily for the people who buy a Rivian so they can use the uh, artificial intelligence, self-driving technology on yep. their own. But you kind of opened the door on stage to the possibility yeah. of pursuing rideshare opportunities. Would you consider your own robo-taxi service? So, you know, from a technology point of view, if you can deliver level four autonomy, so that's with the vehicle where it can drive empty, meaning no one in the driver's seat completely operating itself, that can go towards a personal level four vehicle. It can go towards a robo-taxi or rideshare uh, level four vehicle. It's, it's very much the same technology. And for us, our initial focus is on personal level four. You know, around 99% of the miles driven in the United States are in personally owned vehicles. It's not to say we don't think the rideshare space is interesting. It's just to say that our initial focus is personal. But we're absolutely open to and we'll be exploring ways that we can deploy it in the rideshare space. Real quick, Kelly, I know you have a question, but I want to button this up because people will listen to this and they'll say, are you talking with other companies about pursuing a robo-taxi strategy? Today, we're focused on the technology. We're focused on making sure we have a really clear roadmap and a rapid roadmap to level four. Uh, you know, between here and level four, we have what we call eyes off. So that's a level three capability. You can be in the car, in the driver's seat, but on your phone, reading a book, not actively involved in driving the vehicle. But the next major step beyond that is level four. The vehicle can pick your kids up from school, sure. drop you at the airport, or as you said, enable other business models like a robo-taxi or rideshares. Earlier this year, you also put out a statement on, on the robo-taxi push as well. Yes. And, and <laughs> So the Middle East and, and Asia were the markets for 2025 yes. to launch. And we've seen, of course, that initial deployment in the Middle East already. What's happening on the Asia side? Well, uh, lots of discussions on the Asia side. Uh, I think what's really important is to set up a regulatory framework uh, to go forward. Uh, for example, Hong Kong has various trials and pilots going on, and in many other markets, we're talking to regulators about how we can be a part of shaping rideshare and autonomous rideshare going forward. The technology is absolutely getting there. Uh, these are the robot driver. It doesn't get tired, doesn't get distracted. Uh, and we very much look forward to working with various authorities to introduce rideshare into the markets. Every major market in which we operate, mm -hmm. uh, we are having discussions with autonomous partners and then most importantly regulators mm -hmm. as to how we can introduce autonomous either in a pilot way or in within some restricted operational domain. You know, everyone wants this product. It's a product that's delightful. Mm -hmm. In markets, for example, in Atlanta, in Austin, in Abu Dhabi, our consumers love the product. They feel safe. Uh, and this technology is hitting prime time now, and every major city in the world wants to be a part of that revolution. Let's talk about the U.S. as well, because you're partnering there with, with Waymo as well yes. on, in certain cities. Terrific partner. Yeah, yeah. terrific partner. <laughs> yeah. Actually, in the latest earnings, I think you said excellent as well. But uh, in some places, Waymo is expanding into new cities mm -hmm. without you and becoming a direct competitor. And that's something that was highlighted even by, by Wedbush early this week as being a potential risk uh, for your business next year. How are you assessing that? Well, I think it's, it's uh, the same example that I gave you, that in some ways the McDonald's app is a competitor to Uber Eats, mm -hmm. uh, and the two can coexist. And it's very, very early in the development of autonomous. We have to make sure that we have access to autonomous technology in the major cities that have the right regulatory framework to allow autonomous. And we're very confident as we look at our roadmap and we look at our partners, we have over 20 partners, autonomous partners globally, that we will have access to autonomous technologies in the large cities and markets uh, that really count. When you say access to 20 different partners, do you think that that is the way that the industry will continue to evolve, or do you expect consolidation on, on the robo-taxi side as well, or the autonomous driving software side? What we're seeing is this is a trillion-dollar-plus market. 
uh, in terms of autonomous uh, mobility. I think delivery eventually will be of a similar size. And when you have markets that are that large, you usually don't have winner take alls. It's the same way with these uh, uh, LLM models. There are many to choose from, whether it's an OpenAI or Gemini. And I think the same will be true of autonomous. Uh, it's an exciting technology, but there are many players getting to the finish line. We just have to make sure that uh, the players that we work with are safe uh, and that, again, we're working with the regulators in a constructive manner. Both Rivian and Uber are signaling a major shift. The industry is now moving beyond the testing phase and is now fully focused on commercialization and profitability of autonomous driving. In the first interview, the Rivian CEO admits that self-driving is now their biggest spending category and they are now building their own custom chips to power it. On the other side, Uber CEO is expanding into new markets like the Middle East and Asia and he's partnering with over 20 different companies instead of betting on just one. Are you confused or want to know more about how an AI can make a car drive? Don't worry, I built a course that answers this and many more questions about AI. It breaks down the essentials and covers things like compute and hardware and how AI actually works in the real world, all in a step-by-step -step process that's easy to understand. Once you buy, you get lifetime access and because the course expands over time, the price will also go up over time. So now is the best time to join. Check out the link in the description. Now back to the video. This is really about building the infrastructure. For the last few years, companies spent billions just trying to get a car to drive safely around a block. Now they are spending money to build the business behind the autonomous car. Rivian is trying to become a software company. They realize that in the future, the profit won't just come from selling the truck, but from selling the subscription that lets the truck drive itself. Uber is playing a different game. They know they can't build a better robot than the car companies, so they're building the app store for rides. Their attempt is to partner with virtually everyone, although I think they might struggle with Tesla. But their attempt is that Uber ensures that no matter who makes the best robot car, you still have to open the Uber app to hail it. The shift creates a totally new concept for the car itself. If the car drives itself, it stops being a machine for driving and starts being a room for living. This opens up a huge opportunity for new types of work. The raw power of this AI allows the car to become a service platform. In the future, a commute won't be lost time. It could be productive work time or leisure time. The value of a car changes from how fast it drives to how useful it is while you sit in it. So Uber has the network and Rivian is working on some cutting edge tech. But there is one player missing from these interviews who might have the biggest advantage of all because they don't have to share the profit with anyone. While Uber is forced to split its profits with its partners and Rivian is still ramping up, Tesla is in a very strong position because they own the entire system the car, the software, and the ride hailing network. Uber CEO admits they're an aggregator, essentially a middleman connecting you to other companies' cars. Tesla, however, is building its own dedicated robo-taxi and writing its own software. Additionally, Tesla's approach relies on cameras, which are generally much cheaper to manufacture than the complex sensors many competitors like Waymo use. This is a difference between integration and aggregation. Uber is an aggregator. When you take a self-driving ride on Uber, Uber takes a cut and the car owner takes a cut. That double layer can keep costs higher. Tesla plays a vertical game. They build the car, they own the software, and they run the app. There is no middleman to pay. This gives Tesla a lot of flexibility on price. In a market where people just want the cheapest ride from A to B, having lower costs is a huge advantage. Because their hardware setup is simpler and less expensive to produce, they have room to undercut competitors on price while still making a profit. The deeper advantage here is data. Rivian talks about a data flywheel, but Tesla has had millions of cars on the road collecting data for years. This has helped them create a general purpose driving AI. Many competitors are limited to specific map cities. Tesla's goal is to build an AI that can drive anywhere, even on roads it's never seen before. This raw power means Tesla can potentially expand into new cities much faster than companies that need to carefully map every street. It also suggests that this same brain could one day be used for things beyond cars, like humanoid robots, expanding their business far beyond just transportation. This vertical integration is exactly why Kathy Wood of ARK Invest argues that Tesla is well-valued. Her thesis is about the sassification of transportation. 
Kathy predicts that as the robo taxi network scales, Tesla will shift from a hardware business selling a car once for maybe a 15% margin to a platform business earning recurring revenue on every mile driven. Ads are expensive and people don't trust them anymore, but they do trust YouTube. That's why three of our clients now make $100,000 a month for their business from growing a YouTube channel. If you run a business, book a call with me and I'll help you map this out.